And welcome to Sound Words. Sound Words is the theme that has been selected as a course of study for the Church Street Church of Christ this year. It is based upon some words that Paul writes to Timothy. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel, according to the power of God, to which I was appointed a preacher an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8, 11, and 13. In keeping with this theme, then, of sound words, this program is simply a Bible study. How better to discern sound words than to listen to the Word Himself, Jesus the Christ? So we are using this weekly time slot to simply study the Bible together. We are studying the Gospel of John. I hope that you will continue to tune in at this time each week to participate in this fascinating study. I hope you have your Bible ready so that you can follow along and possibly even take notes along the way so that you can prepare yourself for even deeper study on a personal level. In our time together last week, we were looking at John chapter 18, where the word picture for Jesus is the model sufferer. In this chapter, Jesus was standing before Annas and Caiaphas, the religious leaders of the Jews, being falsely accused, being put on trial, a kind of a mock trial for the things that he had done. Jesus proclaims his innocence by saying he was always in the synagogues teaching and preaching, and they had plenty of opportunity to attack him, plenty of opportunity to disagree, and yet they had not done that. And Jesus gets reprimanded by one of the officials standing by for sort of talking back to the high priest, and Jesus simply says, check my words to see if they're true, verify them even by others who were there to hear. And, of course, no verification is needed because these are false accusations being made in the first place. Ultimately, the Jewish leaders take Jesus to the Roman procurator, the Roman governor, Pilate. And we were concluding our time together last week as we turned the page into John chapter 19. The word picture for Jesus in John chapter 19 is the uplifted Savior because it is in this chapter that we will actually see Jesus put on the cross and crucified on behalf of the sins of the people. And so as we get ready for that development, we see this interesting interchange between Jesus and Pilate. Pilate is one who is not really convinced of Jesus' guilt. He doesn't really want to be involved. He questions Jesus and can't really find any reason to accuse him and tries on multiple occasions to get out of the responsibility that the Jewish leaders have put in his lap, so to speak. 
John's portrayal of this incident is designed to bring the personalities of Pilate and Jesus into sharp contrast. We're going to see Jesus very much in control, very strong, very determined, Pilate seemingly losing control, Pilate unable to stand on his own two feet to make a difficult decision. As John narrates the story, the judicial aspect of the occasion becomes less prominent. It's not so much about judge and jury. It's not so much about a verdict to be handed down. It is more about the character of Pilate that becomes important. John is going to accentuate Pilate's inability to decide because of Pilate's own lack of conviction of Jesus' guilt. It is a trial of Pilate before Christ rather than a trial of Christ before Pilate. The first impression that we get of Pilate in this reading is his reluctance to take part in the action at all. Another feature of Pilate's attitude is his uneasiness all the way through. You may remember we're told in one account that Pilate's wife has warned him to have nothing to do with Jesus because she has had a dream about him. She wants Pilate to be completely free from having to make a decision in this case. A third aspect of the attitude of Pilate is his readiness to hear Jesus. He does want Jesus to speak. He does want to hear Jesus' side of the story. A study of the attitudes of Pilate reveals that he passes from official indifference through curiosity to intense personal concern And then, simply because he does not dare to act on what he knows is right, he gives way to hesitation, to fear, to arrogance, and to bitterness. He is aroused by Jesus' presence and bearing, but he's still reluctant to conform to the truth as the occasion presents it, and so he loses Jesus altogether. The story of Pilate is used interestingly here by John, as the tragedy of unbelief. Because Pilate is not quite convinced, he does not act. And John will say, this is the point of the telling of the story, to differentiate between the value and the reward of belief versus the consequences of disbelief. So now that we've kind of reminded ourselves of the groundwork here with Pilate, I want us to go back just for context sake and read of this encounter once again that Jesus has before Pilate so that we can see all of these things that we've just discussed coming to play. And as we read through it again, just be reminded of Pilate's uneasiness, of his inability to decide, of his desire to know more about Jesus on one hand, and yet to uphold his governmental responsibility on the other. I'm going to begin reading again where we left off last week by reading from John chapter 18, verse 28, where Jesus first goes before Pilate, all the way through John chapter 19 and verse 16. This is the encounter with Pilate. So in John chapter 18, we'll pick up the reading at verse 28. Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the Praetorium, and it was early morning. But they themselves did not go into the Praetorium, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Pilate then went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If he were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him up to you. You notice they don't really bring an accusation before Pilate. They don't really have something to say in response to Pilate's question. They simply say, If he had done nothing wrong, we wouldn't be here. Then Pilate said to them in verse 31, You take him and judge him according to your law. Therefore the Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spoke, signifying by what death he would die. Then Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus, and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Are you speaking for yourself about this, or did others tell you this concerning me? Notice what Jesus is doing here, trying to get Pilate personally engaged in this conversation, trying to get Pilate to make some sort of personal commitment. Verse 35, Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, 
my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. It's a very curious thing that Jesus has just said. He is claiming to be a king, but not a kingdom of this world. Pilate says, Are you then saying that you're a king? Jesus says, I am a king, and I came so that I could bear witness to this truth. If you hear my voice, everyone who hears me, he says, knows that I am truth. Pilate said to him, What is truth? I think that's a true question. I think it's a sincere question from Pilate. He's confused. He wants to know what it is that Jesus has done, and if he hasn't done anything, why is he standing on trial here? So Pilate again says to him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all, but you have a custom that I should release someone to you at the Passover. Do you therefore want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Pilate knows that it's just sheer envy and jealousy that has brought Jesus before him, and so he thinks, here's an opportunity for me to release him. The other thing I want you to notice as we read through this text again together is notice all the movement from Pilate. He goes out and speaks to the Jews. He comes back in and speaks to Jesus. He goes out to the Jews. He comes back in to speak to Jesus. And just his physical movement through this scene demonstrates his own inner wishy-washiness, his own inability to decide. But when he gives the opportunity to the Jews to have someone released, they all cry it again and say, not this man, but Barabbas. Even though Barabbas we see here described as a robber, they want Barabbas released instead of Jesus. So then we go to John chapter 19. Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. A scourging was a brutal whipping. And the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe. Then they said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him with their hands. Pilate then went out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said to them, Behold the man! Therefore, when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, You take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Now, isn't that fascinating? Remember John's purpose for writing. These things he is writing, he says, All of these stories he is telling, many other signs Jesus did in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written so that you might believe what? That Jesus is the Son of God and that believing you may have life in his name. Isn't it interesting here in these accusations in John chapter 19 verse 7, the Jews say we have a law and according to our law he ought to die because he made himself the Son of God. That's exactly the point John wants his readers to hear and to conclude. Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was the more afraid and went again into the praetorium and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then Pilate said to him, are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you? Jesus has an interesting response. He says, you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. 
Now they're appealing to Pilate's own vanity. They know that he's fearful of losing his position. And if he were to admit that Jesus is who he claims to be, that Jesus is the king of the Jews, that means he's raising up a king in opposition to Caesar. That means Pilate himself is some sort of rebel. And so they have Pilate painted into a corner, you might say. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the preparation day of the Passover and about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. There they are turning that knife that they've already stabbed into Pilate's back, turning it just a little bit more. We follow Caesar. You should follow Caesar also is the implication. So then Pilate delivered him to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and led him away. So now that Pilate has delivered Jesus over to the Jews to be crucified, we come to the crux of the matter, literally speaking. The word crux simply means cross. We come to the cross of Christ, the central event of all human history, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. Interestingly, we find in John's gospel, even though everything has been pointing to this very moment, John doesn't spend a lot of time dealing with the specifics of the cross of Christ. We're going to see that he covers it in about half of a chapter in our Bibles. We start at John chapter 19, verse 17. We're finished reading about the crucifixion some 20 to 21 verses later by the time we get to verse 37. And then we read very briefly about the burial in verses 38 through 42. John will dedicate an entire chapter, John chapter 20, to the resurrection of Jesus. I remind you that the word picture for Jesus in John chapter 20 is the conqueror of death. And it'll be for obvious reasons since that entire chapter deals with the resurrection of Jesus. But before we get ahead of ourselves too much, let's go back to our reading. We're going to read about John's account of the crucifixion of Jesus starting in John chapter 19, verse 17. And he, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side and Jesus in the center. Now Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Then many of the Jews read this title, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Therefore the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but... He said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts, to each soldier a part, and also the tunic. Now the tunic was without seam, woven from the top in one piece. They said, therefore, among themselves, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Therefore, because it was the preparation day that the bodies should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with him. 
But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. And he who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, so that you may believe. For these things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled, not one of his bones shall be broken. And again another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they pierced. This is the entirety of John's recording of the crucifixion of Jesus in John chapter 19. So you can see in John's gospel at least that the crucifixion is mentioned in the fewest possible words. John, who alone of all the disciples witnesses it, is the one who actually says the least about it. He does not lay great value upon stressing the physical suffering. Sometimes whenever we think back on the cross, maybe during a time when we're participating in the Lord's Supper, for example, we think about the grueling nature of the cross. We think about the pain and the agony and the suffering. We think about the beating and the scourging that Jesus took. We think about the crown of thorns and the pain that must have caused. We think about the nails in his hands and in his feet. But it's interesting that John, who is the author of this gospel, the one who was an eyewitness of all that took place, doesn't seem to put a lot of value upon stressing the physical side of things, the physical suffering of Jesus. The two paragraphs concerning Jesus' mother which you find in verses 25 through 27, and the completion of Jesus' task, verses 28 through 30, contain all the words that Jesus speaks from the cross as John reports. So in these two short statements, he's going to give us four of the final seven sayings of Jesus on the cross. The words concerning his mother mark the discharge of his human obligations. He wants to make sure that his mother, from a human point of view, is taken care of. I thirst shows Jesus's deep participation in human suffering. He is suffering as a human. He is thirsty. It is finished marks his achievement of perfection. He has completed the mission God has sent him to do. Jesus dies with a consciousness that his work is done and there is nothing left for him to accomplish. A careful consideration of the groups present at the crucifixion shows us that the cross then becomes the dividing line between belief and unbelief. What a way for John to bring this story to a climax whenever he's not only reporting on the greatest event of all of human history when Jesus gives his life for the sins of mankind, but he uses the cross itself as sort of a physical reminder of the dividing line between belief and unbelief. As you recall, all the way through this gospel, we have seen John putting in juxtaposition against one another belief versus unbelief. We saw early in the gospel that there was a thin line drawn between the two, but as we went deeper and deeper into the telling of the story, that line got wider and deeper so that there is a huge chasm by the time you get to the end of John's gospel between belief and unbelief. And it's especially come to fruition here at the cross of Jesus Christ. You see those who believe juxtaposed against those who do not believe. And this is the point that John wants his readers to see so that they can make a decision for themselves. Where do you stand when it comes to the cross of Jesus Christ? Do you now believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God? There are a couple of fascinating things that happen in the crucifixion scene. I love the fact that Pilate puts a sign on the cross that says the King of the Jews. Some of the religious leaders wanted him to simply change that to say he claimed to be the King of the Jews, and Pilate won't do it. He says, what I have written, I have written. And so we see Jesus not only taking care of business at the cross, making sure his mother is cared for, his disciple who's close to him is cared for, that all things are in their place. We see Jesus understanding the power of the moment that he is the king of the Jews, that he is the king of all people, that he is the son of God, he is that long-awaited Messiah, and he is dying then for the sins of the people. As we move on, we see those last few verses in John chapter 19 that describe his burial. 
Let's look at John chapter 19, verse 38. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took the body of Jesus. And Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds. Then they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips of linen with the spices, as the custom of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So there they laid Jesus because of the Jews' preparation day, for the tomb was nearby. So Jesus is buried, and in these just few verses, five verses, John describes the burial. Whenever we meet again together, we'll talk about the resurrection of Jesus, and that's what makes the crucifixion and the burial so critically important. We'll see much later, after the establishment of the church, that Paul on multiple occasions will allude back to the death the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus as the central event of all of humanity, as the gospel story, the good news message. Because of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, all who would follow and obey him in all future generations, you and me included, have hope for eternal life. We have a hope that this is not all there is to this life, that we too can die to our sins, that we can be buried with Christ in baptism, that we can be raised to a new life and live forever with God eternally. That's the promise that was made possible, the hope that was given at the cross. It is a wonderful story, and John simply wants all of his readers, both then and now, to know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Thank you for being with me today. We'll continue our study next week. You have been listening to Sound Words, a presentation of the Church Street Church of Christ in Lewisburg, Tennessee. I am Kyle Bolton, the pulpit minister at Church Street, and I would like to personally invite you to come and share times of Bible study and worship with us each week. We meet every Sunday at 9 o'clock a.m. for our morning worship, followed by our Sunday school for all ages at 10.15 a.m. Then we meet again at 6 o'clock p.m. for our evening worship. We also have a midweek meeting for devotion and Bible study on Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. I hope to see you there. Have a blessed day. Holy words, long preserved for our walk in this world. They resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart words of life, words of hope. Give us strength, help us cope in this world where'er we roam. Ancient words will guide us home. Ancient words. Changing me and changing you, we have come with open hearts, oh let the ancient words impart, holy words of our faith handed down to this age, came to us through sacrifice. Heed the faithful words of Christ, holy words, long preserved for our walk in this world. They resound with God's own heart, oh let the ancient words impart, ancient words. Changing me and changing you, we have come with open hearts, oh let the ancient words impart, ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you, we have come with open hearts. Oh, let the ancient world
words impart. We have come.